John Adams, who had been George Washington's vice president, has now become the second president of the United States. He is going to have a difficult term in office um, for, for a few reasons. Anybody coming in after Washington would have had problems, and Adams did not have the personality that Washington did. Two, he has a vice president, Thomas Jefferson, who is a part of a different political party, so they're going to have differences with one another. And Adams inherits uh, Washington's a ca cabinet along with a quarrel that was going on with France. And Adams is going to do his very best to keep the United States out of war. One of the things that Washington had said in his farewell address was that he felt like it was important for the United States to stay out of permanent alliances with Europe and that we needed to stay out of their wars and any type of entangling alliance or trouble, that we needed to have more time to develop as a country before we got involved in fighting. The population in the United States was doubling about every 20 years, and he believed that at a given time we would be strong enough to stand on our own against any European country, but that if we jumped in too quickly, everything that had been gained up to that point could be lost. And Adams shared that belief with him to the point that Adams is, is going to do something that is going to prove very unpopular for him and probably contributed to him not being reelected for a second term. But the French and Britain, uh, France and Britain are fighting one another once again. And the United States cargoes are getting caught up. Their ships are getting caught up in that uh, problems between the two. And so Adams sent Charles Pinckney, John Marshall, and Elbridge Gerry to negotiate with the French because the French were seizing a good many of our ships, and so problems were developing. Now, they approached. They were approached by three ca French counterparts whom Adams named XYZ when he sent his report to Washington about this. And those ag agents were uh, working for the foreign minister, Talleyrand, and they let it be known that negotiations could begin only if there were a loan of $12 million, a bribe of $250,000 to the five directors then heading the government. Now, it was common practice in that time to pay bribes uh, between governments when you're going to do negotiations, but this was extremely high, and they weren't promising anything. They were simply saying, if you pay all of this, then we will, we will agree to sit down and talk with you, but we're not promising that anything is going to come from it. The commissioner said no. When that XYZ affair broke in Congress and the press, that answer was translated into millions for defense, but not one cent for tribute, and an undeclared naval war raged in the West Indies between the two countries, and there was a big push for the United States to declare war against France. Adams stood up against that. It made he and had he agreed, had he said yes, let's go that, go to it, let's declare war. Country would have been behind him and might have made him very popular, but he believed, like Washington, that it was too soon and that it could hurt the United States and the future of the United States. So he was willing to step aside and to risk his own political career, to be a statesman and to do what he believed was best for the country. We don't often get that. And so it is something to really remember about John Adams that he put aside his own political future for what he thought was the best thing for the United States. And he put that, he basically uh, kept working, trying to negotiate, trying to uh, find solutions to the problem so that there wouldn't be a war. And fortunately, the French did make peace overtures, a new commission was sent, and they were able to work out some of the problems that had been causing uh, so many difficulties between the two countries. In May 1800, the Federalists chose Adams and C.C. Pinckney as their candidates for the upcoming presidential election. The Democratic-Republicans chose Jefferson and Aaron Burr. Both Adams and Jefferson were criticized in the press in the election Jefferson and Burr tied. Now, they're both members of the same party, but they have the same number of votes. Um, they each received 73 votes in the Electoral College, which meant that the choice of the new president went to the House of Representatives. 
There, the Federalists tried to give the election to Burr, and he did not discourage their activities, and that infuriated Jefferson, because Jefferson felt that he was the head of the party, and that Burr should be a gentleman and step aside and give the election to him. And as far as Burr was concerned, it was like, hey, I tied with you. Why should I step aside? Why don't you step aside? Jefferson never forgave him for the fact that he did not step aside and made this become such a drawn-out affair in the House of Representatives for a winner to be chosen. Ultimately, the deadlock was broken when a confidant of Jefferson's assured a congressman from Delaware that Jefferson would not engage in wholesale removal of Federalists, and so that congressman resolved to vote for Jefferson, and several other Federalists agreed simply to cast blank ballots, permitting Jefferson to win without any of them actually having to vote for him. Because no bloodshed was involved, this is referred to as the Revolution of 1800. Because think about what has just happened. The first two presidents were members of the Federalist Party. We now have a new third president, Thomas Jefferson, who is a member of a different political party. And we've changed political parties and nothing's happened. We haven't had bloodshed. We haven't had armies marching. We haven't had violence. In other countries, that would not have happened and that had not happened. So it was a major achievement for this country that the democracy and the government is working the way it was supposed to. And that's why it was referred to as the Revolution of 1800. One other thing that I want to say about Thomas Jefferson and John Adams. Late in life, uh, with the help of a friend, they started corresponding to one another again. And they brought their friendship back. We are blessed and very fortunate uh, to have that collection of their of their letters that they sent to one another during that time period. And it is one of the real quirks of history that on July 4th, 1826, the 50th anniversary of the Declaration of Independence, and remember Thomas Jefferson was the primary author, but John Adams was on the committee with him helping to write it. Well, on July 4th, 1826, the 50th anniversary, both Thomas Jefferson and John Adams died on that day one of the really kind of weird moments in history. So now, in the next session, we will talk about Thomas Jefferson as president.